Walk through the GH4 setup for video. This is a mirrorless camera, um, meaning that it does not have a mirror. I'll open it up for you very carefully in this clean environment. You can see the sensor here, and it does not have a mirror there. If you were using a digital SLR before, it was a reflex camera, and that mirror, uh, there'll be a mirror inside that reflects light up to the viewfinder so we can see what we're doing, um, which is nice because you are seeing light coming through the lens and um, that light, that image is the actual thing that you're, you're shooting. This camera does away with that mechanism and just lets light hit the sensor on its own. Um, the advantage is that it's smaller, the batteries usually last longer, um, but I also, this, this sensor is like extremely high quality uh, in both in color resolution and actual resolution. This is 4K. Um, so there's more rooms for like a better computer inside basically. Um, the disadvantage is that this monitor that we're seeing in the back is a, it's just an, it's a digital image. So it is processing this image. It's not a, always 100% live and uh, not 100% color accurate, or maybe your shutter speed slightly off. You kind of need to review what you shot sometimes to, to get a better feel for it. Um, but it's not big, that big of a concern. So don't overthink it. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great step up from the Canon digital SLR line. So I'm just gonna put the lens on first before I power up. So just remember to match your, your marker markings here. This is a red dot. Red dot. Uh, I'm gonna make sure it's flush before I put any pressure on it. And turn to the right, feel very satisfying click. And we're good to go. Um, feel solid. Don't, don't take your hand off the camera body or the lens until you're very confident that it's there. Take the lens cap off and I'm gonna keep my body cap, rear lens cap and my lens cap all in the same place, which today is going to be my left pocket. All right, so the settings I'm going to walk through here are basically just to make this camera last a little longer, battery life, and make it more optimized for video. Uh, and they're not all strictly needed for, the, for shooting video, but it's, a, it's a generally just a good place to start. So I'm going to turn it on. Uh, on switch is on top. So we'll switch to the right with the dial, and we're gonna make sure we're in movie mode. Creative video mode is what it's called. And it's this little camera and the M uh, on the top here. So I just wanted one more switch on the camera before we get into the menus to set everything up. Uh, this dial to the right of the viewfinder is for our autofocus settings. And if you spin it all the way to the top to the left, you'll, you'll get to MF, that's for uh, manual focus. And we just want to turn off all auto exposure and all auto focus features of this camera. You might turn auto focus back on if you're ever going to run it with a gimbal um, or some kind of tripod uh, documentary setting. But for the most part, we want to be in control of both our exposure and focus at all times. Just want to make it a very deliberate choice so we're just gonna keep it in the manual focus mode for now. And that's the great place to start learning this camera. Uh, this camera hasn't been used in a, in a long time. And the first thing I wanna set every time, uh, but especially when it has been used, and it's reminded me, is to set the clock. So I'm gonna hit menu so I can show you where that is without just going straight to it. So if I go to the menu, the third option down is this blue wrench, and that's the setup menu on the right there, the setup. And we're going to go to the top page one of setup. And the first thing, clock set. So I am looking at 11, almost 11. So it's 10 AM. And this is very important because, you know, these file types, they don't 
give us the most descriptive names. And this is true with digital SLRs and many different cameras of many different brands. It might be, uh, you know, a few n numbers, a few letters, Panasonic, Sony, Canon, uh, and then 001, 002, or, or the date in the title, which is awesome. But we want to make sure that this is set so we have like a created timestamp for every file that we make. Uh, in the future, a month from now, two days from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, you go back through your files, you'll know at least where, when it was created and how relevant it is for your project. As much information as possible is uh, always the best. So very important, always set your clock, do this the night before, and most of these settings you can do ahead of time. You don't need to be, they're not image contingent. We'll do a couple exposure things uh, after I go through the menu. So first thing is clock set. On the same page, page one, we're gonna go to beep and beep volume. And the very last option there is beep off. Just the bottom one, the X. And then we're gonna go to E shutter volume. The very last one is also off. Now, even though we turned off auto exposure and auto focus, uh, if we ever use those in the future, when you take a metered reading, these two, uh, auto exposure and auto focus beep when they take that reading. So we just wanna make sure there's no audio indicator that would make our sound and our shot mess up. So we're just gonna keep that off always. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go to the menu and go to page two. And page two, go down to live view mode. This is uh, two options, 30 frames per second and 60. And, and this is just uh, the, the screen that is on this camera. And I'll flip it out for you just so you can see. Uh, is this in the shot? I don't know. This, this screen here, this mm -hmm. is just for live view here. So it's the viewfinder up here uh, and this screen, this is what is controlling that frame rate. There's not really any reason for this to be in 60 frames per second uh, ever. Um, you're not getting that much more information while you're shooting, but it does really drain on the battery if you keep it in 60. So if we keep it on 30, we'll be in good shape. Uh, we'll be able to shoot for longer. So just 30 frames per second. And then right below this, on the last uh, option there, is uh, monitor luminance. And we want to use the second option. Uh, it's monitor one. Um, what we want to make sure doesn't stay on is this auto monitor. So the reason this is important, if I go, I'm shooting inside and things look good, my screen is sort of dark in this room, and then I go outside, it's very bright. That monitor that you're looking at, you see your, your image, will adjust the brightness based on its little sensor, and that's, uh, our eyes get used to it, and that's just not trustworthy. We want our eyes to like trust the screen more than this auto function. So if we keep it a consistent level all across, then we'll, we'll just get used to like how actually bright that scene is or not. Uh, so just keep it off auto. One and two are the two options. One is the brighter option and two is the darker one. So if you were inside, you might switch it to two. I suggest keeping it on just one though, wherever you are. Uh, just the brightest of the two. So option one, monitor and And then we'll go down to page four and monitor information, it's the second option. And this just gives us descriptions of the menus, this little scroll bar up here. Uh, it just tells us what each option does. You might get curious, look through them, and I encourage you to play with the camera just to, just to see what all the different functions are. Uh, but this, this makes sure we're setting what we think we're setting. Uh, if you know this camera inside and out, you one day might turn this off. You get a little bit more room on the screen, but why not have it on for now? This menu information, 
Now we're gonna keep going down to page five, and this one's really important. This is system frequency. And we have three options. Uh, NTSC is 5994. 50 hertz is PAL, so this is very uh, Eurasian, uh, pretty much most of the world uh, is, in, is in PAL. Uh, and that's based on their electrical grid, so the refresh rate of their electrical grid. Uh, these two are very video options. If you know in the future you're going to stick to 60 frames per second, you're going to mix it with some compositing and after effects, some 3D, uh, any kind of animation actually, I would stick with one of these two flavors depending on where it's going to be distributed. If it's going to be distributed in the US, stay with 5994. Uh, anywhere else, PAL is good. Um, you can change these later in post if you need to, but why not start where your, your distribution is going to be. 24 is the the frame rate for cinema that we're very used to, 24 frames per second, right? It's that, that sweet spot in the persistence of vision that keeps the illusion alive uh, without adding too many frames and, and more data, basically. So we keep it at 24, we're still gonna get a very cinematic look on this camera and not crazy huge file sizes. Uh, and we can shoot 4K, it gives us a little bit more options. I'm gonna suggest you start at 24 uh, for most projects. You set this, and if it was on something else, it's gonna restart the camera at this point. We're done with the setup menu, and I'm gonna go over to the top one, which is motion picture. And this very, very first one, photo style, is super important, um, but I'm gonna show you this. Uh, we're gonna come back to it when we look at our image. Um, so we'll skip this for now, but it's very important to set before you start shooting. We're gonna go down to record format. And this is one of those things that you would decide the night before, the, the day before, the, in pre-production. What format I'm gonna shoot at, what quality I'm gonna shoot at. Uh, let's look at our options here. Depending on your memory card and frequency settings, some of these might not be available. But we mostly just have two. Uh, if you follow my recommended settings, you're gonna have two options, MPEG-4 and MOV. Now, not big differences here. Uh, we're gonna be able to shoot the same quality of video. MOV is an Apple codec, so it's a container for how our files are written. MPEG-4 is a more generic, it's very PC, and Mac friendly. So I, if you know you might go both places, shoot on the MPEG-4. And I'm just gonna suggest you do that today. It's just a little bit more easy to troubleshoot. Um, but if you know you're never gonna leave Mac world, MOV is totally okay. So let's go MPEG-4, give you a little warning about you know, needing a fast computer basically. And then now we're gonna go to record quality and we have our different options. It's the very bottom one here, it's the 1920 by 1080. And it's actually a flavor of what I'm gonna suggest. You can scroll up and see all of our options. And this window just tells us what, what it's gonna record at. So this is a 4K, it's a cinema 4K ratio, 24 frames per second. Uh, the image is actually gonna output 24 frames per second if I'm recording on a separate uh, monitor, for instance. Uh, and 100 megabytes per second is the data rate. So, you know, that I might be concerned how much file size I'm going to take up with this. Uh, and then our audio. So, if I go down, I can see how 4K here, you know, it's a little bit more cropped, but everything else is the same. Uh, this is all I, so it's a, it's a HD format. The only difference is that it's all intra frames, so every single frame of our video is getting saved uh, at a pretty high quality versus these other codecs. They will make up some frames in between. So, you know, it only actually records a picture of every, say, four or five frames. Frames between one and five are made up by an algorithm, essentially, like a basketball going across the sky, that orange basketball, frame one here, frame five here, the algorithm says, hey, it paid, it picked a frame three, 
move the orange pixels this direction and the blue sky pixels this direction. It's not important about anything else, just move all that information that was the same as before this way. It's a very reductive way of explaining it, but essentially you're saving so much data and you see this is 200 megabytes per second. So this is all I is considerably more. I might use this if I'm using green screen where every frame is pretty important because I want a, clean, a cleaner key on every frame. Uh, if I know I'm gonna use digital effects later on, this might be really important for me too. Uh, these other flavors are so high quality that I, I'm not sure I would worry about it too much. Um, I'm gonna suggest that you use this full HD, 24, 100 megabytes per second. This also gives us a variable frame rate that we can play with later. All right, so I'm gonna set that. I'm gonna go down to exposure mode, which is on the same page, page one. Uh, and I just want you set on manual. These other modes give you priority for shutter speed, for aperture, for ISO, and it'll take away some options that we have when we're setting our exposure. And we just wanna be in control of all three of those elements. So manual mode. I want, the goal here is to, is to learn and practice so as much as we can put in manual and at your fingertips, the, the better. So page two now, go down one, and we're gonna go to continuous autofocus and just make sure that's off. It should be because we did switch that switch earlier. And then we're gonna go to metering mode. This doesn't matter so much, but if we ever do turn our meters back on for focus or for exposure, uh, this one does the whole frame. And I think that's a good place to start. So let's do that. All right, so now we're gonna go down to page three. And this is very important. We're gonna set our luminance levels, the bottom option. And we have three. By default, this camera usually is on the second one, uh, one of these 16 to 235. This is the luminance level that this camera records at. Uh, luminance is measured on a scale from zero to 255, and this is the brightness of every pixel. So every pixel in that sensor measures the brightness, and uh, if it's 100% white, 100% blown out, it's at 255. If it's pitch black, zero, no information, it's at zero. We're gonna try not to ever hit those marks, and I'll explain that in a minute, but we want the full range uh, in our data when we're recording. So this is less important about what your, your image is doing in the camera, but when it's recorded and used in another program like Resolve or Premiere or whatever your flavor of nonlinear editor is, we want that movie file to tell the program, hey, I recorded this on the full spectrum, so don't don't stretch my data from 16 to zero or from 235 to 255 uh, and it would manipulate my brightness a little bit because it doesn't know how to handle it. So let's not confuse it. If you always keep this at zero to 255, then we'll have the most room to play with and post if we need to. And the color on this camera is very nice. So we want to preserve all of that. We're going to go down to page five and turn on the mic level display. And this just gives us on-screen meters, uh, which I can show you real quick. They're very small on this big screen, but we have our audio meters on our monitor, uh, which we want, we want to know how that's doing. Ideally, we're gonna have a separate record for audio, but it's nice to have some scratch track with some levels on our camera that are healthy, right? We just need to know what's going on. We can match them up easier in post. Go back to the menu and right below that is mic level adjustment. This is where we're gonna set our levels, whether we're using an external mic plugged into the camera or uh, just using the, the manual audio here. Uh, this is how we're gonna set our levels. This is a little bit of a hot mic. Um, so you usually need to dock, knock it down to negative four, negative five, uh, just for safer levels. Um, but do check this every time. Uh, you'll need to adjust this. And remember that we don't want anything to peak. So we're, we're going for the negative 12 mark here. So when, when I'm loud, so like I'm not quite there, I need to up my levels 
but I'm also behind the camera right now, so that's not a big deal. But that's our goal. We go back to the menu and go down to page six. And this is another audio. Two things we want to change, a uh, mic level limiter. And this just is like an auto feature for that, for audio for recording. And it limits it if we ever get too high. We, we want it all manual. So just turn that off. The next thing is, is related. And this reduces the wind noise. Just detects wind uh, blowing across the mic. And if it sees it, it'll dip out the audio automatically. We have better ways of cleaning that up in post. We hopefully have better ways of recording it anyway, somewhere else. Uh, but if that wind cut accidentally dips out and you know dips out of our, our subject's dialogue, for instance, we'd be in trouble. We'd be losing a lot of data. So we don't want the, this guy to handle that. We want to handle that later. Uh, so just turn it off completely. All right, so now we're going to go down to the custom menu because we're pretty good at here. And this is the second wrench with the uh, C next to it for custom. And page two is the eye sensor autofocus. We're going to turn that off and the AF assist lamp off. Again, these shouldn't be on because we changed some of our autofocus features earlier. Uh, but in case you turn them on for some reason, we don't want the auto part of that to be on and we don't want the, uh, the light that comes on to help metering to, to turn on in the middle of a shot either. And that can happen. It's a little like orange grid sometimes that you might have seen and it helps bounce back to the sensor to aid when you're in a really dark spot. So now we're good. We're going to go down to four and turn direct focus area on and then go down to the manual focus assist. And you'll see the options here. We're just gonna set it to the AF mode button. Again, it doesn't help us right now, uh, but if we ever turn auto focus on, we don't want it to be listening to the lens when we're doing it. We want complete control, so we're gonna make sure it's in the menus instead of, the, of our switch. And then we're set here, we go down to four, and some really important ones on here that I hope you use a lot, and these are some, some tools to helping with our exposure and focus. So the first one is peaking. I'm gonna turn this on, uh, but I'm also gonna go to set. So to take a look at set, and you'll see the detection level and the display color. And peaking is telling us what's in focus, and it highlights the edge of whatever's in focus. So uh, it did the, basically the computer inside the camera analyzes the image and anytime there's a really sharp pixel edge, so like a really uh, contrasty pixel edge between two values, it will highlight those edges with the color. So right now I have orange, so you might see uh, Julian here, I didn't introduce yet. It, the, the parts in focus are peaking here. Uh, that's not great um, focus. Right now, let's see if I can adjust that to show you. And the level is really low, so I can change this to high. And if I get this a really soft focus, everything's blurry, I get no, no lines at all. So if I bring Julian back into focus, so that's the camera in focus. And I go back a little bit more, I should really get I can't really get Julian, it's too dark. So it compares uh, pixel values, right? So you can see where the high contrast areas pick up a little better than, you know, the black hoodie on the black wall. But you can see he's in focus. So this is just a tool to help us with focusing. This is very easy to turn off on our, on our screen. So if we have it on here, it's very easy to just use on the fly. So it's a really important one. The next really important one is histograms. I'm going to turn that on. Once you have this on, there's a little box that's going to show up that's going to, that we can move around. You can use it, just your finger on the touch screen here. And this is our histograms. Uh, I can hit set here. And I'll go back to the menu, to the, our image, just so you can see here. Histograms. Our value, we were talking about from 0 to 255 for our luminance. 
This is what it's measuring from left to right. So how many of your pixel values in this entire image are on the low end here? So that's probably you know, 75, 80 or below, which makes sense. They were in a, in a dark room wearing black hoodies and black pants and it's just like everything in here is very dark. This is like a little bit of highlight here, some orange, uh, not, not much at all. And I'll show you this more when we go over exposure. The histograms are an exposure tool that I hope you use for every shot. It's just no reason not to. All right, so menu again, and page five is Zebra. And you have some options to set this. This is also related to the luminance level. And you get a Zebra pattern uh, when our luminance level is above a certain value. So if it's above 80% or 100 of the defaults, I'm gonna change 100 to 95 because it's not useful to me if it is 100% uh, blown out. I wanna know when it's close to getting blown out. So I'm going to look at the lights here so you can see these lights are exposed for over 90% lumen. And let me tighten this down. Now they have a zebra pattern on them. So if that level ever gets over 95, it's just a warning. Hey, it was blown out. Now, sometimes you might get a little like reflection in some eyeglasses or someone's shiny face. You might need to like put a little makeup on them, knock that down. Uh, you know, someone bald's hair, head, you can put a flag up and knock that, that down. You just don't want to take care of anything distracting. Uh, otherwise, you know, your, your overexposure in general uh, should be within the histograms anyway, right? So um, I can see right here this little peak. That is this light because I am probably at 98% luma or something around there. Super, super bright. So I need to adjust my exposure if this is important. Sometimes some zebra things are going to be in your frame. That's totally okay. This is to make sure that you're not losing data on like large areas of picture. So that one's super helpful. And I think setting it at 95 is really great. Um, and then go back to the menus. There's a couple more things. There's constant preview. And this updates this screen that we're looking at. Uh, not so much the screen here physically in this room, but the screen that you're looking at on your camera is not necessarily updated all the time when you change some exposure things. Uh, think about, you can't really see shutter speed in uh, a live view necessarily. So this is doing its best to update constantly. It is a little bit more of a drain on the battery, but we wanna see as close to what's happening as possible so I think it's a good idea to leave that on. And then exposure meter, you turn that off. And this is just the little dial on the bottom. If you're used to photos, it says like zero, one, two, three, negative one, two, three, to help you kind of know where exposure is. We're gonna use histograms, so we don't really need that, but that's what that is. And then we're gonna go down to monitor display style. Wait, no, not that. Go back. Video, priority display, on. And this makes it to where the back of my screen keeps all this information. Uh, so uh, my f-stop, my shutter angle in this case, and uh, my recording format, my peaking's on, my histogram. It keeps it all to the side of the screen so that it's a little easier to see while I'm shooting video. For photo, uh, some of that stuff's more on top of the screens and that's okay because I take one picture, I see the picture. It's not necessarily an instantaneous thing. Uh, so this helps us just like get a clearer, less cluttered view of our screen. One last thing, and before we can look at our stuff, on page eight, we wanna shoot without lens off. Uh, in case we uh, use a, a lens on this thing with an adapter, we need this feature off. It won't let us use the camera without detecting some sort of lens. Go back to page eight. 
I sensor, and we're going to turn this sensitivity to low, and the live view mode to auto, and this just makes it to where uh, if I close the screen, then it knows that you're going to use the viewfinder instead. So it's that just switching back and forth using this eye sensor that's on the back of the camera. Uh, it gets rid of my image when I have this set and it sort of detects my eye going up to the screen. That can be really annoying. So you just want to set, you know, which one of these you're going to use. Um, auto is fine. If you find putting your, your fingers while you're messing with controls too annoying, um, just keep it on the monitor. So now I put my hand up to this and it doesn't change. Uh, so now if I put my eye up to the piece, it doesn't change either. So it is really nice to look through this viewfinder. Uh, I would get into the habit of doing it. We look at our screens all the time, but like get a little closer and your the world will go away a little bit and you can get focus on what you're actually composing. So that's what you, you know, auto or just one or the other. And now we're good. Um, I want to go back to the first page in our movie settings. Page one, the very top when I said photo style and show you the different uh, color profiles this camera has. Um, Sin like D, Sin like V, standard, vivid, natural, monochrome. I'm not sure the other scenery. Um, these are just color profiles for this camera. I'm going to suggest you use two of them. Sin like D is a very high quality, kind of flatter profile that records things very evenly. Uh, you'll notice things don't look very vibrant. If I go to V, contrastier, punchier, right? All these colors, uh, way contrastier, got, got significantly darker. Both of these are the higher quality codecs of the options here, or color profiles. Uh, there's also settings you can find online if you get into this world. Uh, you can, there's even something you can download. Never ever use monochrome. Uh, you can make it monochrome and post uh, much higher quality. You want all that information to push around. If you want to do any kind of post color work at all, use Sin Like D. You're less concerned about pushing it around in post and you just want to focus on shooting and less on the color side later. Sin Like V. It'll give you a little bit more contrast and color out of the box. Still very high quality if you need to do some pushing around later. Um, those are the two flavors I'm going to suggest. Now, very important, I'm going to go out of this menu and set my white balance on the top of your camera here. There is a white balance button, WB there. I'm going to hit that. And you'll see at the bottom of this screen my options and your screen if you're following along. I have auto white balance. It's going to analyze the, the rooms, the pictures, the color picture, the pixels coming in and set based on that. Uh, I have sunlight, I have cloudy sunlight, I'm in the shade, I have tungsten, and then I have uh, some custom settings, and then I have this Kelvin thing I can adjust. Just to show you on the, the last option here, I have a, a, a thermometer here that says all my color temperatures, and the very bottom is, is candlelight. So that's like 2000 or so Kelvin, it's very, very warm. Uh, you, you notice candlelight's always have a very uh, contrasty, orangish glow, the caps and everything, very, very warm. Tungsten is here, that's 3200, so candlelight's around 2000. Tungsten is 3200, there's not any tungsten right now in this room. Uh, and then sunlight, you know, varies from hour to hour, where you are in the world, and the, the, the you know, cloud cover, so, um, you know, twilight and dusk and sunrise, you know, they're all very, very orange, uh, that very, like, more candlelight glow, and versus an overcast day, which is very kind of bright light, bluish, you know, 5,500 or so. Um, if you go a little higher, be 58, 
6,000 if you're in the shade. And that's just because the sunlight's reflecting off things and picking up a little bit more color. Um, so it gets bluer actually, the higher temperature you get. Most of the time you're gonna set this deliberately to 56, 59. Um, if I go down here, you can see this is, this is my daylight color temperature. I can dial in exactly to what I think it is. And LED bulbs, which you'll use uh, increasingly more and more, are balanced for that. It's that really bright bluish white light. Can't trust our eyes on this. You need to dial this in every time. So every new scene that you're in, if you're in the same room, it's fine. Uh, but if you're, in, if you're moving around in a house, it might be different lights coming inside, different lights in your room all together, different bulbs. You're gonna have to reset your white pedal. The other way to do this is to take a picture and use that picture as reference. Uh, you just take a still picture of a white card and, uh, and, and that, that automatic adjustment from that picture is, is totally really good. We would never want to use this auto balance here. This will adjust it from shot to shot or reanalyze it and you'll end up with this shot to shot inconsistency that's like one's bluer, one's redder and it's a nightmare. So that's really important to set every time and we have white cards for checkout but a white piece of paper in front of camera evenly lit is perfect. So let's go back to our movie here. Now I'm just going to talk through our, our exposures, like the most important part here, uh, other than our composition. And I'm just going to see if I can get a little bit more daylight in this here composition, kind of focus on this chair, have Julian in the foreground, chair in the background, some stuff back here so I can show you depth of field. Uh, notice my histograms here, and I'm gonna I'll move this over to the other side of the screen. My histograms here are showing a lot of very dark values. And what I want to avoid is clipping, so I don't want any of my values to hit this zero mark, and any of my values to hit the, you know, 100% white mark, 100% luminance. So I'm gonna go for an exposure that's in between. Uh, with knowing that this room is very dark, I'm going to have a lot of stuff in the low end, but at least I'm getting all that data. So let's first set our ISO for this camera. Uh, and it's here in the bottom. Native ISO on this camera is 400, no, it's 800. So I'm gonna start at 800. ISO is the sensitivity of the sensor. It's rated uh, very closely to how film's rated. So an ISO 800 should behave the same in a digital camera as a piece of film does. With at a given f-stop, they should be they should behave the same way. Now, the higher the sensor goes in ISO, the the, the more sensitivity this camera has to the light. So it's telling that sensor, hey, up the volume on this pixel data that you're getting, even if it's not there, up the luminance that you get that you're seeing. So I've just upped it a lot. And let's just go one more so I can show you. If I go to 5,000, I'm getting a lot more noise in these shadowy zones. So any, any time it's very dark, I'm getting this kind of pixel dance happening. And here, and any like flat color, uh, the shadows is where you'll notice it most. And it just looks like visual noise. And that's fine, sometimes you're gonna have to live with that. There's just a point at when it becomes distracting uh, and not gonna match with the rest of your footage. So be very careful. <laughs> the lower you can keep it, the better. I'm gonna try to put this at 800. 800 is the native ISO, which means that this sensor was made to be the most responsive at 800. So uh, to see the most dark values and light values and, and their highest quality it, it was tuned in for that. So if you keep it there, that's great. Sometimes you're gonna have to go down, it's really bright outside. Sometimes you're gonna have to go up, it's really dark inside. So if I go the other direction, um, obviously very dark. Not too many downsides to going, turning down the volume, but I'm getting less, uh, so I'll, I'll up my, sh my shutter here just to show you if it's evident. Um, I start to lose some, some values here. Uh, 
this whole section of this flat is now the same color instead of having more texture. So I, I lose the sensitivity of the sensor when I go extremely low and I get like kind of banding happening, which is like all these pixel values are the same, all these are the same, and again, sometimes you're gonna have to go low, but we just to the point it becomes distracting, you wanna avoid. So that's, that's that banding thing there. This isn't so bad. Um, my shutter speed is extremely slow, so this is why it's a little bit choppy. But try to keep it at, at 800. Uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is shutter speed and aperture. Uh, the two things you're going to be changing the most when you're shooting, generally your ISO is going to be set. So let's do shutter speed first. Uh, this dial on the back, uh, on the back side, I'll now sh just show you here. It's the one facing you, a horizontal dial. And as I spin this, you'll see 80, 60, 120. So these are all hundreds of a second. And it's this value here. You'll be changing this a lot as you shoot. And I can, all, I can go to really long exposures here and I can get tons of motion blur. So it's pretty insane. Um, if I go down, that's the lowest I can get. The rule of thumb here with shutter speed is to double your frame rate. So if my frame rate is 24 here, I want to try to get one that is as close to double as that as possible, which I think might be 60. Maybe we have 50 here. We do. And this just gives us, for every frame that gets exposed, it's exposed for exactly half the time. And this is a, a shutter speed that we're used to. It has just enough motion blur that we kind of enjoy it, um, but it's not very choppy. Now, if I were shooting high-speed uh, subjects, uh, sports events, wildlife, you know, safaris, I might want a really, really fast shutter speed. So if I go the other direction, and I have to change my ISO here, it's dark. So let's go 640 and let more light in. You might not see because it's dark. Uh, let's see, ISO, you can kind of see. See how crisp these all these items are when I when I pan slightly? It's because I, there's no motion blur at all, so I'm I'm getting really crisp edges for everything. No no delay on our exposure. Now that would be great for wildlife and sports. Anything we also might slow down later, uh, so we have crisp images. Uh, so the other direction, really low lighting situations, you want a longer exposure. Um, but things do get a little bit blurry. Now that could be very nice for some creative purposes. You know, get that motion blur going. The last part of our exposure, we've done ISO, we've done shutter speed, is aperture, and this is the lens. It's the size of the opening in the lens, letting the light in. And that is here, measured in f-stops. Uh, and again, we're just, we want to look at our histograms here. It's the last step, so uh, let's change this. But I'm gonna change the ISO back. Let's get back to some normal values here. Um, so ISO is 800 and uh, that was back dial here is my shutter speed. I'm gonna go to 60, 50, I'll go 40, give us a little bit more light. And now aperture, changing this value with the front dial on the top. So, um, Shutter speed and aperture on this camera are super easy to adjust on the fly because it gives us two wheels to do it at any given time. The front one, aperture, and the back one is shutter speed. So if I change this aperture and I go all the way, if I close it down all the way, so I'm making the aperture super, super tiny, not letting very much light in, you can see it's way too dark, so I, I, can't, I can't use that. I'm gonna go the other direction, and open it all the way, um, still clipping, so that's not gonna work either. I gotta go back and adjust either shutter speed or ISO. Let's go ISO, and let's go up two stops, 3200, which is significant. So getting closer, aperture. Now I, can ha now I have more leeway here. The major creative choice that you'll have with your aperture is depth of field. Uh, the, the more wide open my lens is. So right now I'm at 3.5, completely letting the most light out in. The, light, the, the lens and the, the aperture is way bigger, 3.5. My depth of field 
is a lot shorter. So this is a, a big creative decision you're going to have to make. Like, how much do you want in focus? Depth of field is the distance that is sharp in focus in your scene. So right now, my background is out of focus, and my foreground is more in focus. Uh, so I'll just show you. I'll, I'll make the background in focus here. Let's go. Let's go all the way to the back first, and then I'll come forward to my hand. Right. So I actually have. I can go a lot closer here on this lens, right around there, and then go all the way back. The background. That's a very shallow depth of field. Not very much is in focus at the same time. If I go the other direction, uh, so I, I close down my aperture, so using the front dial, close it down, I'm going to have to adjust my shutter speed here, and my ISO, it's just too dark. If I go the other direction here, I can get a deeper depth of field. So now when I cycle through, there's a lot more in focus at any given time. Everything in the background, including Julian, is in focus around this, this red mark. So that's a lot safer for uh, events, documentary, uh, you do need a lot of light, so if you're outside though, you can close down your aperture and have a deep depth of field and be safer. You don't constantly adjusting your focus. Aperture controls focus, shutter speed controls your motion blur, how, how crisp each exposure is, and ISO controls your sensitivity. The three of them together are what you're going to need to pay attention to to make your histograms, your exposure right and even. This doesn't have to be in the middle every time, but I just don't want it to clip, so I'm gonna just do that right now. I never quite had it. I will change my aperture, just open it up more. I'm gonna see if I can drop my ISO down a little bit, and then change my shutter speed to get it more in line. There we go. So I have a healthy exposure. There's a little bit of clipping, as you can see, exposure here and here. Uh, that's not a big deal. Um, you see that tiny little value on my histograms. Uh, but I have a very healthy exposure otherwise, and I feel like I could safely make this a little darker because I know it's so dark in here. But this will be very easy to fix in post. And that looks good. Now that's, that's the basics of this camera. Um, you know, going through the menus and then setting your, your exposure. These two dials are what you're going to use so much. Uh, just practice using them, check it out and dialing in that exposure. Uh, and this translates very well to the other cameras we have. Those are the aperture and shutter speed is what you're gonna be adjusting most of the time. Okay, so this is a field monitor. Uh, as we were watching what we were doing on this big screen, it's very helpful. Um, but this guy is seven inches, it's 4K. It's a much brighter, bigger picture and really, really great when we're shooting outdoors. The screen is kind of small, we can see what we're doing. Um, you can even have this off to the side. If you're shooting in a tight spot, the director can be viewing from a little bit away with a longer HDMI cable. We're going to put this one right on top of the camera uh, with the help of a, a ball head hot shoe. I'm going to screw it in. Now this is uh, Sony battery powered, which comes in the kit. Uh, it can also be powered by USB, um, like battery packs that you would charge your phone with, for instance. Um, so I'm going to slide it on top here, and I'm just gonna face it towards you so you can see, and tighten it down, make sure it's very secure, tighten the ball head. It comes with a solar shade, very helpful when you're outdoors. So I'll just put it on, it's a little Velcro guy. And you'll need a HDMI cable. Uh, this camera has an HDMI uh, micro, very, very tiny one. You'll need an adapter of some kind. We have these also for checkout. Plug them in, uh, secure this somehow with Velcro. Uh, you'll have a smaller one, so, you can put it on your pan arm, the little piece of Velcro. Uh, you just want it to where it can't get snagged off. So there's even a tie down right here, just so that it's not like loose hanging. Uh, you don't want to destroy this port for the HDMI or the one that's on the camera. So like as secure as you can make it, but a nice big bright picture. And this one has a nice guide line to it for aspect ratio. Um, I, I can add that, uh, I can turn it off. Uh, but if I know I'm going to crop later, I can keep this up. So yeah, field monitor, it's just very handy to see what you're doing. Um, another feature of this is that uh, I have, the, the HDMI carries audio, so I can plug in headphones to this monitor. And I know this audio isn't ideal, but at least I am getting a little bit more controlled and uh, 
more importantly, it's not being played back to our subjects. So I can hear them and see the picture and really focus on what's happening at the same time. Uh, so great for directors if you have someone else on camera. Uh, but that's Field Monitor and I encourage you using it and it works really well for the GSLRs as well. If you can't use a Field Monitor, uh, the app, the Panasonic Image app, is what this is called. Uh, it works for, I, I think, every format. It's like Google, Android, uh, I think uh, iPhone, iOS, all of them. Um, you can connect your camera over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi and see what you're doing, as well as adjust your exposure. You can record, press record, take stills, uh, and you can even offload media this way as well. You go into your menu settings setup, uh, and the first page is the Wi-Fi. You click there, Wi-Fi function, the top one. Um, I can't do this at the moment, uh, but you'll, you'll see a Wi-Fi address that you would need to connect to on your phone. Uh, it's pretty simple. The QR code that comes up is very hard to use and rarely works. It's better just to type in the connection automatically. So uh, you'll see here, I get out of the menu. Um, I, can, I can see my image. Um, I can adjust, I can hit, can hit record. Um, I can turn peaking on and off. I can adjust my photo style, recording format, the most important things. And then if I have my digital zoom on, I can adjust that here too to, to see my focus. Uh, so all my remote functions are available on this phone. Uh, great for COVID times, uh, but also just to see what's happening when you can't get quite close to the camera. So multiple people shooting, assistant director, director, that kind of thing. Uh, this is very, very handy. Um, once you set it up, it's, the QR code is just difficult, just want to tell you. Yeah, re reviewing your footage is really nice and really quick because uh, you don't have to go over to the camera, you can just watch it. And, you, and this screen is nicer and plays back faster, right? So that's, that's a really great thing. You can also tag your footage. Uh, you can be like, I shot this here at this location. Uh, you can also tag your actors and things like that uh, if you want to log every shot. But yeah, the remote operation is the most important thing. That is the Panasonic Image app. Um, and yeah, I would download it and try it out.